I'm, I'm pressing it right now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Jerry Wang. Jerry, are you ready to be great today? I am. Jerry is an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley with a background in tech startups, software development, marketing, and operations. He made his first website at 13 in 1996 and has been building websites, applications, mobile apps, and chat box ever since. Prior to this, Jerry served as a Marine Corps combat engineer from 2003 until 2007, doing construction and building elements for the Marine Corps, including the Board of Defense Arizona. Currently, he is focusing in on food and retail, bringing e-commerce best practices into the brick and mortar world to bridge the gap between the online and the offline. Jerry, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So Jerry, what are you focused on right now? So what I'm focusing on right now is uh, building retail stores in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I find it to be a, a very, a very, I actually lucked myself into this situation. And uh, what I'm actually enjoying about it so far is the fact that it's making use of, of a wide variety of skill sets I've learned in the past. And uh, it's a day by day challenge. Every single day you wake up, there's always something new to look to work at. And so for me, the way that I have built my career up, the way I've kind of gathered up my skill sets, it's, it's actually the perfect use. It almost feels like every day you gotta wake up and you gotta be Batman and you gotta tackle all these issues and figure out how to approach it, how to solve it. And uh, not only that for yourself, but also for your team, for your customers, for your partners, investors, backers, and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things involved. So for me, I actually, actually enjoy it right now. So Joe, are you talking about like actually brick and mortar story? Yep, an actual brick and mortar store. So uh, about two, about a year and a half ago, I transitioned away from doing uh, technology work, although I always had like a, a one foot in, one foot out type of approach. And uh, a year and a half ago, I was able to work with somebody to open up our very first retail store. Uh, we made a ice cream shop that serves out boba teas, snacks, uh, to serve out a local community uh, nearby. And that started the process of learning the ins and outs of setting up like a quick service food restaurant. This year, I got myself into a opportunity where I was able to open up my own coffee shop slash boba tea shop out here in Silicon Valley in downtown San Jose. So now that that's my second store. And I'm also working with my partner on that store to help her uh, run the other store that she has. And we're always on the hunt to try to figure out how to get another restaurant or get another business going. So always looking around to try to see if we can scale out what we have learned and built so far. And this is what you mean when you talk about, I think, offline or online or online or offline? Yeah, so this is a really interesting topic. So one of my backgrounds has been working with uh, working with digital agencies to help people with uh, consulting on their e-commerce business digital marketing, try to figure out how to grow, whether it's a Shopify store, Amazon brand page, or whatever the case may be. And one thing that uh, is kind of a wave from quite a few years back, and it really actually originated in Asia, was this concept that uh, it's called O2O, online to offline. And it could also be inter interchangeable, so you could also do an offline to online type of approach. And the basic gimmick is this. Uh, imagine back in the day, like, when we're, when I was a little bit older or a little bit younger, like we would go to, you would go to your mall to, to be able to buy stuff, right? And then obviously Amazon came in, changed a lot of that aspect of it. People are comfortable with paying with credit cards online and buying stuff online and stuff like that. But there was still kind of a challenge where in the past, those two worlds didn't really quite connect. And it's only recently that you started to get to the sense where it's like, yeah, you can order something online and pick it up on the curbside. But a few years back, that was not a thing. You know, it was only recently that that become a little bit more normalized. What's happening this year is that that is actually accelerating. So if the opportunity is, or if the situation is, is that you can't no longer walk into a retail store, interact with someone there um, in order for you to make a purchase. But yet at the same time, it's a little bit soulless to be able to just buy stuff online, take a look at pictures, rely on your reviews to make your decision making process. Um, there is a blend that some people are working on right now to kind of bring those two worlds together. So a couple elements of that would probably, would probably be things like having an AI chatbot to facilitate uh, some decision making or recommendations on your end. Also, the other way to kind of look at it is how do we bridge the gap in terms of supply chain management 
you know, if you're able to scout out and look in a local area and know of your inventory from different brands, different stores, uh, surfacing that in a way where someone can buy that online on their phone, on their laptop, and be able to go pick it up in real time, that's also something else that a lot of people out here in Silicon Valley are working on to try to figure out bridge that gap. And so now we're starting to see this online, offline type of approach to figure out how to bring those two things together. So Jerry, are you going to expand to all kinds of retail or just stick to a certain type, like liquid beverages, or are you going to expand to different types of retail? I think right now, at this point, I think I'm going to focus entirely on food just because uh, a, a long time ago, someone taught me this really great adage. At the end of the day, no matter what, it, what happens, everybody has to eat. And so if you could focus on trying to figure out how to bridge uh, that element, bridge a complexity of managing, and this is only after I started working in the business that I realized how complicated it could be, the food supply chain, trying to figure out how to get food from farms, whether it's local or far away, the ability that uh, our systems that we built up has been able to kind of transfer vegetables, proteins from all around the world to end up on your table. To be able to figure out how to solve that and make it more efficient, to be able to figure out how to leverage uh, a, a team, a crew, because you still need people to be able to make your food for you. Um, to be able to blend all that stuff together and at the same time, be able to help people even discover you to be able to enjoy your food. Um, that's a big enough challenge right now. So I think I'm gonna focus entirely on that world for, for the time being. Okay. Yeah, because there's a guy up here in, in, in Seattle with Bunko Labs, Richard Brion, he's trying to do the same thing. And, and we did a presentation yesterday, he, and he actually said, you know, like, I can't, well, I can't name the guy saying you know, the software in the world, but he said, yeah, well, the world can eat software, right? You still have to grow food and deliver it, right? You still have to eat. Everybody's got to eat, no matter what happens. Exactly. So let's table this for a minute and go back to, I want to go back to your background. When you were 13, you won some kind of contest, right? Can you talk so, about that? Yeah. So this is actually really cool. So I actually grew up with the internet. So uh, ever since I was a, a kid, um, I was actually very fortunate that in my household, we had access to computers. Uh, we had access to a modem way, way early on. So this is back in the day when like you had, you're having 2400 baud BPS, 2400 baud modems, you know, back in the day. And I got to learn how to build uh, PCs with Intel 386, 286 chips, and where I was trying to learn how to figure out put like things together and then make it work. And to me, it was it was bedazzling. Um, this little box with all these little electronics inside it was able to open up a whole new world for me. And so, I was really, really early on, really grateful that I had the opportunity to be able to have access to those type of things. Um, I discovered the internet way, way early as well. And uh, being back in the day, I was kind of left to my own devices to figure out how to solve this and solve that or do this and do that. So one, one particular opportunity I was given was at a certain point back in the, back in the 90s, somehow, some, some way, I end up on the website uh, where they were asking for people to design a web page. And at the time, I figured out how to design web pages by, you know, doing things like GeoCities or Zoom, all those old, old sites back in the day. And so I actually built a pretty darn cool website um, showcasing, and this is where the fun part was, this whole contest was held by a university in, uh, in a country, Taiwan. And so that was where I, was, I, I grew up in, I was, I originally was from. And so I was able to put in Chinese letters to figure out, I figure out how to do the Unicode to be able to put in some Chinese letters. I figure out how to make a Java applet that does a reflection of, a, of an image. And all this stuff was just stuff I kind of was trying to learn from other people about figure out how to do it. And so I put it all together, submitted it, didn't think anything else about it because I was like, who, what, what's, going, what's going to happen? They're not going to pick me. And lo and behold, my mom gave me a call because at the time she was still living in Taiwan. She gave me a call uh, a few months later saying that the city of Taipei asked her to show up for a award ceremony. And she at the time didn't know what any of that was about. So she was like, what the heck is this internet thing? What's this web page thing? What is this? What is all this? Like, what, what are they trying to invite me to? And I didn't know what to say because I was like, well, show up if you can. She didn't take it seriously. So what she told me after the fact was she actually went shopping. She went grocery shopping and right before the thing. And when she showed up at this official looking type of place, she had her shopping bags, this and that. And they were so happy to meet her because they assumed she was the one that did it. 
obviously she wasn't. And so they granted her this award with my name on it saying that, oh, this is great. This person did a great job making this website. And then she just goes around talking, thinking to herself like, wait, my son's 13. What are you guys even talking? He's not even in this country right now. He's in America. And you say he made this webpage? So it's a very different, I think it's a very different experience from what uh, kids are used to right now. Like the type of youngsters that I see nowadays where they're able to go out and do hackathons over the weekend and be able to do this. The level of skills that they have versus what I had doing back then is way beyond what I could have been capable of back then. So I think it was just lucky on my end that, um, lucky on my end that at the time, no one else was on the internet no one else knew what's going on and so i got the opportunity to actually try to make something cool so that was a really really quite a cr crazy trip i had so let's have it at 13 what age were you first got started getting interested in the internet and computers and stuff like that probably like 11 or 12. so that was like a really a really long time ago and so like i said i i remember back then uh we had the first on our block in our neighborhood we were the first ones to get cd roms uh, we had a 1x CD-ROM that we were able to build into, <laughs> we were able to plug into a PC. That changed my whole entire world, man, because once, once I'm able to pop in a CD with an encyclopedia on it, I was like, wow, this is, I could just sit here and just read the stuff all day long. Once you strapped on the, the modem, I was hogging up the, the phone line almost every single day as best as I can, just because the access to information, the ability to see what other people are doing, um, and the best part too, this is how it began with my software engineering kind of career was the trick back then was you were able to view the source code of any page that you browse. And so when I find something that I really like, the ability for me to actually inspect the code and take a look at how they built it triggered this whole thing in my head where I was like, oh, if they could figure it out and the source code is literally right there, I too can figure it out. And so the way I had approached this problem wasn't so much like, I want to go to school and learn about this. Cause at the time school wasn't teaching any of this stuff. So my approach was, I'm just going to keep on hacking. I'm going to take a look at how they do this. I'm going to reverse engineer it. I'm going to hack around it. I'm going to try to figure out problem solve it. I'm going to ask questions and see how that goes. And so that kind of began my little unconventional software career where actually it did take me about 10 years to finally learn how to code properly to be able to be a professional software developer. So it's kind of a long journey, but I, I wouldn't give up for anything else in the world. So Jerry, you often hear the term good code, bad code. What is, what, is that even a reality? Is that really a, a thing? Is there such thing as good code, bad code? What does that even mean? I think there is. So it took me quite a long time to kind of figure this out as well. So one thing I had, I think <clears throat> my approach to, to, to software, to tech, to all this stuff, um, I've been immersed in it for quite a long time. And so my view has always been like an inside out view. So I never really kind of looked at it from say, Hey, you know what? I'm from a different part of the country or from a different part of the world. I'm always excited about seeing how, you know, all these people Silicon Valley are walking around doing their thing. I get to see it from, from the inside out view. Cause I grew up in Cupertino. I grew up in Silicon Valley. So I've been here almost my whole entire life, just watching people around us, trying to figure out how to do this and do that. And so I think I had this mentality back then of thinking to myself, everything that I was making in the beginning was bad code. And I assumed that by default, everyone else who might have gone to school, might have done this, uh, that might have got a, a, you know, a degree in this and that, they were writing good code because how will I know the difference, right? If someone had graduated from, say, Stanford or Berkeley or Harvard, whatever the case may be, and they're writing code, my assumption is that they're writing good code because they went through that process and those type of colleges would not graduate somebody writing back code. It took a long time working in the field inside the industry to come to this realization that that's actually not true. So there is a difference between good code and back code. And the way I look at it is good code is something that is actually something you could maintain and it's something that's accessible. It's not so much about whether or not you're writing it the right way or the wrong way. It's just the fact that you're able to have a second person be able to understand it. That's the difference between good code and bad code. You can write it all wrong, but if it's making it so that a second person or a third or fourth can read that code and understand what is wrong, then you actually made good code. It has to be readable by a human being in order for you to, to be able to have it be good code. You need to have it so that's maintainable, it's fixable, it's addressable, 
you could write the most efficient one line code in the whole entire world. But if only you can understand it, that essentially is bad code. Like it might work, that's great. But what if you pass away and your legacy now is to give this riddle to somebody else to try to maintain that piece of code? That's not a good code. So I think there is an element of elegance and beauty in terms of being able to communicate your software and your code to a human as well as a computer. So that's my realization in terms of like what's good code and bad code. And that kind of in turn kind of pushed me to say, okay, focus not so much on being more efficient, focus on more so how do I communicate this piece of work so that way other people can work on it with me. And that's how we can scale faster. I don't want to sit there and kill 12 hours a day, but if we have a team coming together and we all do our normal five, six hours out of the day to get something done, that's actually much better. So that's my take on it. So how, how, do, how do you do this? Like, I think the challenge a lot of developers have, just my opinion, like they're, they're start a project and they, can either, they have two ways to either like do a quick in a hurry and push it out and be kind of like a low quality, but you get the product mm -hmm. out there fresh you can, or they take the time and have high quality. Of course, then it takes later for a product to get out there. How do you balance those two? So uh, one particular mentor I had throughout the, my time in Silicon Valley is this guy named Paul Graham. He started the White Combinator program. Um, he was an early coder for Yahoo. He did a lot of great work. He made his own little programming language. So he had a book out called uh, Hackers and Painters, where what he was trying to focus on is the fact that to a certain extent, when you're writing code, it's, it's very similar to you being an artist approaching a blank canvas and the way that you would get the code done or the way that you get your pain done is you continuously work at it, work at it, work at it, work at it. There are some people who are the type or that mentality where until the very last stroke, until the very last character, um, the work is not done. And so they keep on trying to add to it, contribute to it. The reality of it though is that's not something that is deliverable. Like you might be lost in the process of always trying to figure out how to make it so that the code looks great, it's better, is the pain looks good, or all this stuff is better, but you have to learn how to ship it. You have to learn how to get the code out there on devices as possible so that it actually has a meaning for it. Because once you could find the meaning for the software that you create, this is the next professional thing that you should do. You got to figure out how to fix it, maintain it, contribute to it, add more features to it. So sometimes people get lost in the sense of like, I want to make the best first version of something. When in reality, it's not so much about that. It's how do you get it to work just to get people to be excited about it. If you get some people excited about it, it's worthwhile for you to keep on investing your time into it. So I've seen people in the past, I've, I've met people in the past where they, they literally put in a good solid chunk of their whole entire life in making this grand vision of a computer game. And it ends up being that no one ever got a chance to play it. And so to me, I'm like, that's such a, it's both beautiful and, <laughs> and sad at the same time where it's like, you put in all this passion into something, but at the same time, you're not able to share that passion out. I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to be Van Gogh having put in all my passion on the paintings, but I'm only, only when I pass away that people actually are appreciative. I actually want to get a little taste of that appreciation right now, you know? Yes. So I think it really depends on how you want to approach it. Do you want to do more of the elaborate way? Do you want to do more of a professional way? I think the time and the situation call for different approaches. Learning what the case is, having that bearing is actually also a very important part. Your next move after that. So after high school, you joined the Marine Corps, correct? A little after high yes, school. Yes, that's right. Yep. Can you talk about why you joined the Marine Corps and your experience in the military? Sure. So um, <clears throat> I got through, uh, I got to go through 2001, 9-11, uh, uh, back when I was in high school. Uh, that was my, that was my junior year, actually. And so that kind of shook a lot of things in my head. And I think one thing that kind of made it so in my mind was, you know what, I, I came to this country. I absolutely love this country. Uh, it's afforded me quite a lot of things. And so the time, I think the zeitgeist of the time was that um, we will like to contribute. People will like to help. And so my way of thinking about it was, you know what, I'm going to try to figure out how to maybe serve 
in my own way. And so 2001 was in the first, I didn't actually volunteer or enlist around that time. Uh, I enlisted towards 2002, the latter half of 2002, when I finally graduated from, from high school. And so I applied and the way that it happened was they didn't actually respond back to me. So I originally simply applied to, I applied to like some recruiter and they simply gave me some information. I turned that in. A few months later though, a Marine Corps recruiter calls me up on a Saturday morning and invited me to go to the recruiting station and talk to him about seeing about my opportunities while working in the military. And one thing led to another where I was like, this is the right fit. The things that he was telling me about what the Marine Corps espouses, the values that they espouse, the challenges they had to face. Um, I thought to myself, like, this is kind of a fit for me, perhaps, just because I felt a little bit lost at the time. Uh, one additional thing that kind of clinched it, which he sold kind of well, was just the fact that at the end of the day, if you can meet up on the challenges that the Marine Corps has to offer you, it's by far the toughest out of all the branches. And so when you leave out of it, when you, what you could take out of it isn't so much, <clears throat> isn't so much of like they're gonna pay you more or so much that your lifestyle is gonna be any better, but it's like after you're done with it, you would be reassured challenges that you face later down the road are not gonna be as challenging as the things that you're gonna do in the Marine Corps. So in my, in my thinking, I was like, okay, sounds like this is more of an investment <clears throat> to the rest of my life. Uh, I mean, if I don't die in, in a war or something like that, um, where I could get some dividends out of it. And at the time, my family was adamant about not doing it because coming from a traditional Asian household, uh, choosing choosing the military over college is not what you want to do. And so, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. about to say you're probably not the normal <laughs> path. No, and especially back then, the back then the, the mentality back then was also um, electing to to join the military at that time was a certainty that you're going to die because they're going to be sent to war, and there was a lot of disagreements about. Uh, the validity of this and validity of that. And so that conversation overcrowded of the fact that this is, to my sense, a form of service to, to the country. Um, and, and you're in the Bay Area when you joined too, right? Yep. So I joined up in, in San Jose. So again, I remember back then, a lot, of, a lot of the conversation was like based around one, did you not have any other opportunities? Two, uh, are you poor? Is that why? Three, is it like, are you just not, are you just dumb? Or four, I mean, it was just a wide variety of all kinds of, of things. And so I, I blocked as much of that out as I can, just because once I set my head into it, I kind of said to myself, I really want to see if I can do it. Um, and to be honest, it was a very challenging for me in particular, just because my body is not meant to be, <laughs> to be a good Marine. I realized, I realized something afterwards. I was not a good Marine to, to the physical standards. Um, I was always the slowest. Uh, I was always, I, I, you know, it wasn't because I was lazy. It was just that I was always the slowest. Um, my crew helped me out and skipped past a asthma check. And I definitely had asthma where I was just like, damn, I can't, I can't do this. But he was like, no, don't worry about it. I got you. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try for it. And so I'm actually very, very fortunate that never had an asthma attack in the military, never had that be an issue. But at the same time, <clears throat> I was never the, the most physical, the most fit, the most, I didn't look like a Marine. I didn't do any of that stuff. But my heart and my mind was in that place. The, the challenge of serving the Marine Corps, the brotherhood that I joined in on, uh, made it so that I, I would do anything for anyone else that has enlisted or served in the Marine Corps as well. Uh, sight unseen just because the fact that I was given so many opportunities I've been so grateful of all the all the camaraderie and the, and the support that people gave me while I was inside it so my heart and my mind definitely belongs to the Marine Corps even though my body was never quite able to make it um, but I feel like I think I got a different experience out of that which is even though I was always the slowest I never gave up and even though drone instructors would, would scream and yell at me and be held behind while the rest of the platoon is running far, far down the road, I thought to myself, okay, if, if you're going to take the time to give me some special attention, let's make this fun. And so I'm going to run no matter what, even if I can't do it anymore, the fact that you're next to me and you're still going to make me catch up, I'm going to put all my heart and my mind into it. 
And so I'm proud to say I never gave up, even though I might be the last one to show up, I'm never gonna give up on the fact that once I put my mind to something, once I'm surrounded by people of equal, equal heart, loyalty, and dedication, I will do my absolute best to, to give that back to people. So that was what the Marine Corps meant to me overall. You bring up a good point. Like a lot of people who haven't served the military, they don't get or don't understand the bond that the military have, right? I mean, they just don't get it. And, and, and is, is there no way to explain to them either, is it? No, there's not. And it, it took me a long time to, to, to come around to this. There was at a certain point, someone was mentioning me like, what, what was the whole point of this? And I think, I think the way I explained to him was this, like at, for a brief moment in my life, I felt this connection where it wasn't about going to war. It wasn't about trying to figure out how to kill somebody. It wasn't about trying to do your job or this or that. Uh, the connection that you feel when you serve in the military is the fact that a person to your left, to your right, is right there with you. And they feel the same towards you of helping you out and trying to make sure that you're going to be okay. And so they're not there because they kind of want to. I mean, they got, they're they there because they got an order told that they have to be there. And yet, despite all of that, no matter where you are in the whole entire world, the person to your left, to your right, will treat you with the same dignity and respect. And to a certain extent, for a brief moment, I felt the fact that there, people are willing to die for you. They don't know you, but the fact that you guys are wearing the same uniform, they, the fact that you guys have been through the same bullshit, the fact that you guys get both screwed over by a recruiter or by a military order or by this or by that, the common story, a, my recruiter screwed me over. Right? There's an understanding. And so therefore, that understanding is what ensures the bond is going to be real. It's what ensures that people will help you out no matter what. And once I left, once I got out of the service, that connection, I have never felt it. No matter where I went, whether it's a tech, a giant big tech company tries, that tries to pretend that they're all family and everyone treats each other like, you know, this and that whether it's going to be a small startup where, you know, everyone sees each other every single day. I think the realization becomes that in those, op in those type of places, people aren't saying to your left or to your right because they have to be there. They're there because they want to be there or maybe they, they, they apply to be there and they're there just because of the paycheck. That's it. And they can and leave whenever they want to. They can leave whenever they want to. So the bond is not going to be as, sincere or it's not going to be as deep as the one where you are just a bunch of people <laughs> being forced to be in the middle of nowhere told to watch over some stupid thing being handed all this equipment that's way more expensive than you could ever afford and you're told not to break it and you're basically trying to cover each other to make sure that you're going to get out of it okay and so i have never felt that experience anywhere else so i think that bond is really hard to explain to people because they're just never experienced it and so the only thing you can do is tell stories of it. <laughs> and hopefully the stories, whether it's song, whether it's movies, TV shows, essays, or the case may be, hopefully that could at least get the message across. And I'm sure it's been passed through from the hundreds of years that the mil U.S. military has been in service so far. So, Yeah, and I think a lot of people in the military struggle with that when they, when, when they transition, right? They try to capture that and they can't. How, how did you deal with that when you left the military? I feel really lost when I got out. Um, there was definitely quite a, quite a long duration time. It almost felt like to me, the metaphor was for a while, you were huddled to, next to a fire. Uh, and people, to, people around you were all huddled together around that fire at the same time. And when you leave the service, you are pulled away from the warmth of the fire. And now you're kind of left to fend for yourself. They might give you a box of matches and told you and tell you go start your own fire to keep yourself warm. But the thing is, is that sometimes people don't have the, the means, the skill sets to, to start a fire and keep that fire going. And so the first year or so I felt really lost because of the fact that once you got a taste of that warmth, um, it's hard to kind of find it elsewhere and it's not given to you automatically. So I really had to learn how to adapt and learn how to kind of recreate that myself or find places where that's happening. So thus began my, my attempt at trying to figure out how to build a, a actual career, get jobs and try to fend for myself and kind of figure out how to do this and do that. And so deep down though, in my mind, no matter where I went, one thing that I always thought to myself was at least they gave me a box of matches. 
And so I'm going to go try to start that fire all over again. And it's only now after all these years that finally I got to a point where I created something where I could build a team around me. And I'm trying my best to repeat that experience I had before where I could share a little bit of that bond, a little bit of that loyalty, that dedication with the people that are electing to work with me. Um, so they could get a sense of what that, that feels like, but it took me a long time to figure that out. So, um, one way I'm paying back is trying to figure out how to support other military veterans who are being, who are trying to be business entrepreneurs. Um, so that way they can also kind of figure out how to find that for themselves. I feel like entrepreneurism, is probably the closest, fastest thing for you to be able to do it. Because if you have a sustainable business, you have a fire. If you have a fire, you can get other people around you. So that's my kind of thinking behind it. So Jerry, talk about how you got involved. Of course, you already you are living on, in the Silicon Valley area. How do you get your career started at, in the Silicon Valley area? How did that come about? Um, I literally just walk into the door. And so, <laughs> so this is a funny story. So uh, I live in Cupertino. And so after I got out of the military, after I got out of the Marine Corps, um, the first year was moving back home, staying back home, feeling like dejected from the fact that I don't have, I don't have that college lifestyle that everyone else around my age, my peers were, were experiencing. Um, I don't have any job prospects. And so one day I woke up, my mom was yelling at me about why you're always at home, why you always look deprived, why, why, blah, 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 nonstop. And so for some reason, I decided to take a walk and I ended up walking about maybe a mile, mile and a half. And I ended up at a, uh, at a headquarters, one of the buildings of a headquarter of a company that makes uh, a little device that everyone has in their pockets right now. And I literally just walked in. I followed somebody in. Once they flashed a badge and opened the door, I just walked in. And so one thing I did was I kept on asking people to decide for a job. And I was actually very fortunate that the third person I talked to happened to believe in me enough to be like, okay, I'll, I'll give you a shot before they call security and kick me out. And so thus began my, my need to have to learn how to use a Apple laptop to figure out how to flex a little bit of my web design skills. And I was actually very fortunate that led to a, a brief time where I was able to work on um, helping launch the iPhone back in 2007, 2008. And so I was building, I was building websites, um, <clears throat> helping manage uh, this new term I had to learn back then called knowledge management. So there was this concept, this idea that you would handle hundreds of thousands of support articles to figure out how to support all the different products you have, maintain all the different documentation. So it was essentially almost like working in the library. You just get abundance of information and your whole job is just to maintain that database and build new content, create new content, if that's the case may be, uh, remove content, curate content. And so I, to me, I actually really enjoy it. Um, I got a taste, just like I said before, when I got my first CD-ROM and plugged in a CD for encyclopedia, and I just went to town learning everything. This to me felt like that as well. Like I got access to archives decades of what uh, this company was doing and my whole job was just to figure out how to maintain it, how to support it. And I was just so in love with it. Um, and I was fortunate enough that they were working on this new project uh, and they were saying, Hey, you know what? We need you to update this file or create this new document to showcase it. Here's the prog manual before it even got released. Um, and we need you to kind of create the doc, the, the websites for it. And so, to me, I was like, this is a front row seat to something that's absolutely amazing. So I actually was very fortunate that the very, the very first thing I did just happened to be kind of a straight to, straight to the pros, straight to the Yankee Stadium, just watching everyone else do that. No, no minor leagues, no nothing, just right, no, right to the Yankee just, Stadium. I, that, was, that was the proximity just because of the fact that was the close proximity. And so that kind of began the whole thing where I was like, okay, this is really interesting because someone somewhere a long time ago built this out. They didn't do this overnight. They started out in the garage and they built this out to a point now where they're able to execute on some of these projects or some of these things. So in my mind thinking, okay, if they were able to do it, I can too. And so I kept on trying to figure out how to learn the next step, the next step and the next step. So a couple other places I went to was uh, trying to figure out how to be a, a online journalist. So I started writing for Business Insider, for Gawker, for ValueWag back in the day. 
Uh, I got to work on marketing so I can learn about how tech startups deal with marketing. Um, I even got a brief, uh, I got a brief time while I was in Google doing their HR stuff. And they were able to talk about, they actually have an approach called people, technology, and operations. That's what they call their HR department because their approach to HR is that people, technology, and operations are equally the same and are absolutely critical to the health of your organization. So my goal at the time was how do I go about all over Silicon Valley, whether it's uh, downtown San Jose, whether it's San Jose, whether it's San Francisco, Oakland, how do I just keep on knocking on doors? Because that was a strategy that worked for me the first time. Just knock on doors and just keep on asking, can I, can I help? How do I help? What can I do? And if I don't get any response, I would literally, my one trick, this is my one trick, what I didn't even, I don't even submit resumes. My one trick is, if you have a company that you want to work for, and it's small enough where you could figure out how to find out the CEO or the founder's email, your trick is to figure out how to look at their website, <clears throat> look at their offerings, look at their new cl news clips, whatever the case may be, outline three things that they're having problems with. Give them three solutions and email that directly to the CEO, to the founder. And the number of responses I got back from that was amazing. Like even if the CEO doesn't have time for me, he would kick me over to somebody else who does have time to talk to me. Just the fact that you took the effort to be able to pinpoint what problems they have and providing them some creative, challenge, creative solutions for it makes it worthwhile for them to have a chat with you. Because if you're good at what you do and you spot some challenges that they actually are working on, they're gonna try to figure out how is it that you figured that out in the first place? And second, how is it that you came up with a solution for it? Because they're probably discussing it right now in the boardroom somewhere and they're probably writing off ideas. And so we'll love to have a chat with you. And so that, my approach- that, that's, that's, that's great advice. Right? Because that was my approach. I, every single time, like the problem comes from the fact that you have to do this over and over and over again. But the more you do it, the faster and the better you get at it. So now I'm at this point where if you point me any, any company's website, I could take a look at it. I could do a deep dive, go through every single page. I could point out maybe the fact that the graphic design doesn't look like it belongs there. Maybe they hired, hired out too much, outsourced it too much. It doesn't look like a fit. I could point out maybe the copywriting isn't that good. I could point out maybe something's too slow. I could point out maybe the fact that their PR, the press releases isn't, isn't written in a way where it actually makes a good case for what they're trying to do. I could point out the fact that um, maybe the software they have, once I make an account, I dive into it. This is broken, that's broken, this feature doesn't work, that doesn't work. And it took me a long time to figure that out. But I'm very grateful that every now and then there's, there's founders and entrepreneurs and other people out there who gave you a shot to, to let me be able to do that and learn those skills. So, yeah, so that was my way of getting through Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah, back to your job search thing. I mean, that's so great. Cause like, I think too, too many people look for a job now, it's all about me, me, me. What can this job do for me? Mm -hmm. Not realizing like no one's gonna hire you for that. They're only gonna hire you if you can if you can add value and you know, like like here I like to say you know Amazon hires you a hundred thousand, they expect two hundred thousand from you, right? And and so many people have a different mindset. Like and in your way, just upfront show how you can add value. Just great. Start the conversation that way because if you can start the conversation right off the bat saying that I'm here to help you out, it changes the tone as to how they they respect you and how they treat you, because if they see you as an employee you will always be forever beholden to how they want to deal with you. If they tell you this is the policy, that's the policy. But if you start showing up the day one, you say, I'm just here to help. And here's the problem. And right off the bat, if you just leave me alone, let me do it. I can fix it for you. They actually might start trusting you. And once they start trusting you, it's a very different type of conversation or attitude. They have Definitely. You. Unfortunately, so. so many people don't do that, unfortunately. So a lot of times they don't. So when I talk to you younger folks right now where they're like, how do I start to, how do I get started in Silicon Valley? Do I do a resume? Do I do this and do that? I'm like, no, man, like either just make something really cool that people will pay attention to or figure out how to help debug or fix someone else's issue, right? Right off the bat and keep on coming up with creative solutions, even if they're not right, even if you're guessing, the fact that you're making that initiative, you're showing initiative, which is yet yeah, another something that you learn in the military, show initiative. A lot of people don't do that. Tons of people don't show initiative. They're only being told what to do and they'll only do that part. So if you take leadership, if you take charge, if you show initiative, that alone, just showing up, that alone can at least get you, get your foot through the door. And afterwards, of course, you have to 
bring some skills to it, right? You can't just be like, I'm just here super eager and I'm going to do, I'm going to do all this stuff and mess everything up. Like eventually you're going to get sick and tired. Of you. Yeah. You got to have some talent. You got to have, you got to back that up. You got to keep on studying. You got to keep on working. You got to keep on being a good person, sharing your knowledge, working with people, helping people out, bring good attitude to work every single day. Cause that's how you stay. Right. Cause otherwise, yeah, after a while, they just get sick and tired of you trying to help out, but it doesn't go anywhere. So the start of conversation, at least, though, starts off with initiative. Just show some initiative and go from there. Jerry, talk about a silicon stereotype that's true and one that's not true. I think, I think, so I'll be honest with you. So here's what's hilarious. So I actually have never seen the TV show Silicon Valley, partly just because I grew up here. So to me, I'm just like, I live this every single day. I don't know how, how a TV show is going to portray it or this and that. But there's, I think there's this sense where there's a sense where um, people from the outside in look at Silicon Valley as the holy grail of all things technology. This is the source of where all the cool stuff comes from, blah, blah, blah. And, and unfortunately, that's not the case. So this is what's so hilarious about Silicon Valley, at least in San Jose, where I'm coming from. Uh, San Jose started out as a, as a military town. Uh, it's all farms. It used to be all farmland. It's all pastures and fruit yards and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. They were just trying to figure out how to grow fruits and make a living by farming. Then the military came in and started building a lot of these, uh, Levitt towns, these like giant, you know, tracts of land just being converted into housing. And they kept on doing it, kept on doing it. And so the infrastructure here is actually very old. It's actually very outdated. I mean, there's a reason why. <laughs> Stanford's nickname is called the farm because it was literally a farm, you know? And so what's hilarious about it is despite the stereotype of like, this is where technology comes from, my phone reception absolutely sucks. The number of times my calls drop is almost every single day. I have wow, to deal with never phone I had like the top, the top, no. everything. Phone reception is bad. The store I have right now where it's in downtown San Jose, historic building, second street, been there for a long time. Guess what? I only have DSL. That's capped at 10 megabytes down. I have problems with connectivity. I have problems with this, problems with that, partly because it's not, it's not a modern infrastructure. It was never meant to be. And the cost of implementing some of that scares even the likes of Google. They were trying to figure out how to build in fiber optics lines to figure out how to speed all this stuff up. And they gave up on that. Like if Google gave up on trying to figure out how to increase connectivity in San Jose, there's no one else that could figure out how to make that happen. Right. And so there is there's this sense where it's like we're at a weird crossroad where the, a lot of the innovation, a lot of the things came out of the area. But we're at a point where a lot of the infrastructure is aging. And if you don't take a look at the infrastructure that's built out in places like Asia, Korea, China and stuff like that, they modernize recently. And so they get all the fancy 5G, quick connection, cheap stuff everywhere. And they take that for granted. Whereas here, I'm like, I can't even get fast internet on anything. Yeah, I, I was in Korea from 05 to 08, and people have no idea how far advanced they are as far as that kind of stuff. It's, it's like magic over there. It's, it's the future over there. And here we are still trying to figure out how to deal with this stuff. So the most futuristic part of the country uh, doesn't even have, you know, the oldest thing that you could find in Asia. Oh, man. That's hilarious. But, but there is one thing. So this is what's interesting now. Um, there is one stereotype about Silicon Valley where I think is still holding true is the fact that at the end of the day, we still are innovating and I'm doing my absolute best every single day. I'm trying to figure out how to make that happen. So what I mean by that is, for example, uh, at my retail store in downtown San Jose, I've worked with, I'm working with a company called Kiwi Bot, uh, that based out in Berkeley, California. Uh, they're started by a bunch of Colombian graduate students that came all the way to Berkeley to try to figure out how to make this project alive. And there are these little AI robots that will do delivery for you from point A to point B. And so I utilize these robots to deliver coffee drinks, boba tea drinks to my customers in the local area, in the downtown area. So there are days when I walk outside and you see these little lunar rover type of things self-driving around. Those electronic scooters like birds and lime, all that kind of stuff. They even got those now that are self-driving by themselves. The scooters are self-driving by themselves. There are self-driving cars 
rolling around downtown, learning how to map out the area and driving by itself. So you start to walk around and you get the sense where it's like, yeah, that's, that's the Silicon Valley I know, where like at the end of the day, people are still trying to push the boundaries a little bit. Self-driving cars, self-driving scooters, self-driving robots that can figure out how to deliver stuff from point A to point B. That's still Silicon Valley to me. So that's still happening on the day in, day out. Why is it like that in Silicon Valley? Is it just an everyone's DNA there or just the way you're growing up, the culture? You know, just what, what is it? I think there's two parts. One is just the fact that there's a legacy there where people before us, the pioneers, that pioneering spirit never left. And each generation subsequently adopts that kind of approach where they have to say to themselves, um, before me, maybe my, my, my granddaddy, my daddy, whatever the case may be, did X, Y, and Z. So therefore, I, in, I turn, in turn will want to figure out how to push the boundaries a little bit. It's also a big draw from people all around the world recognizing this place. That's like, that's where you go in order for you to make it. Uh, just like how you go to New York to try to make it or Hollywood to try to make it. You go to Silicon Valley to try to make it. So you bring new energy year in, year out, where a lot of really talented and smart people come here to try to figure out how to make do their turn of this Silicon Valley journey. And I think it's also just the fact that the infrastructure, even though it's a little bit outdated, it's still built up in a way where it's conducive to try to create new things. Um, you do have the college system nearby. You have Stanford, you have Berkeley. You also have San Jose State, uh, which turns out to be actually one of the best engineering schools since the 70s, but it's such a hidden jam that no one really kind of pays attention to. And that's right, that, right dab right in the middle of downtown San Jose. So you have these college campuses where you have lots of kids who are really bright, trying new things all the time. You have these big tech companies that have established themselves for a long time out here. And you have generations of people who have come here to try to figure out how to make it. It's just perfect fertilizer for people trying to figure out come up with new ideas and keep on pushing the boundaries a little bit, you know? And I could be wrong, but the gold rush back in the 1800s in that area too, right? The gold rush is also around this area. Uh, the military thereafter, they brought in a lot of people. So back then it was also the main industry was things with uh, military defense contractors. So you still have Lockheed, you still have a lot of big military contractor companies still out here at the, at the edges as well. And you have orchards, you have farms, you have fruit, you have all the people who are trying to figure out make agriculture. Back then that was like a huge thing, trying to figure out how to increase yields of harvest and trying to be innovative on that part, that was like the early, early Silicon Valley. That was like pre-Silicon. That was just like trying to figure out how to make things go faster, go bigger. So I think there was always this go big or go home type of mentality here. And that has never gone away. So there's always so, been some kind of pioneer spirit there. Always some kind of pioneer spirit. Always something like go big or go home, bet big, try, try things and see what happens type of mentality. You know, I travel around the country quite a lot. Uh, and I... Every, every part of the country has its own little unique thing to offer. And it's, I've started to see a little bit of that kind of mentality, that Silicon Valley mentality in other places. But at the end of the day, this is home to me. And so therefore, I, I just haven't found something where it's something where it has the same type of spirit, that same type of culture quite yet. Silicon Valley so. so far ahead. Like, you know, other cities like Seattle, Austin, Boston, where it could be, we won't be the next Silicon Valley. They'll never catch up, right? Silicon Valley is so far ahead. I mean, as far as VC money invested, startups, I thought, all the metrics, I mean, they're so far ahead. I just, Silicon Valley could shut down for like 10 years, and I don't think they would still not catch, catch up, you know? I think so, too. And then, But then at the same time, I think there's also this kind of cautionary aspect of it. So you look at something like Detroit. You look at some, a, like a city like Detroit, where it was the spearhead of the automotive industry for a long time. The whole infrastructure there was to figure out how to build these warehouses or distributors or you know, third party contractors that would feed into the system to build your car. And that was existing for hundreds of years. I mean, like a hundred years or so. And things started to kind of chip away at that mentality and things changed and now it's not like where it was before. And so to a certain extent, I think that could happen at any given moment. And so despite the fact that you might have a lead now, that doesn't mean that you have to, you can rest on it. Like you have to keep on pushing, keep on pushing. So maybe that's the only difference is Boston can catch up, but at the same time, it will catch up. But if it doesn't keep on pushing forward, like Silicon Valley is, Silicon Valley still try to get ahead. So that's a key. Anyone else can catch up. Anyone else can work really hard to get to where Silicon Valley is at. But if you stop for just a moment, if you give up for just a moment, 
Silicon Valley goes right back because that pioneer mentality, that dedication, that loyalty, that, that perseverance, that grit is still always here. So. So Jerry, next I want to talk about new developers. Whether well, someone that has a college degree or Princeton Coding Academy, and where they're like the young college, you know, mid age, what are the kids would be? They're getting start a new job, new career as a developer. What advice do you have for them? Always be curious, always be learning. I think that's always the most important part. Um, the volume of, of information, best practices, and um, all this stuff changes constantly. So the way I had looked at it was. I had thought that when I first started, if you had just learned one computer language, one programming language, you'd be fine for the rest of your career. And it turns out that's not the case. Um, best practices and how things, how things are done changes almost, in the beginning it was like almost like every, every other year, then it became every year, then it became every quarter. And then slowly I got to a point, at one point I was really into this technology called React Native. Uh, it was a Facebook technology that made it so that you could use JavaScript to make mobile apps. And when they released version 0.01, I thought that was just really, really cool. Within a few months, then everything changed. Um, with 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, 0 .04, every, every new change just kept on making it so that it's more and more interesting, more and more weird. And you have to keep up. And so it's a, it's a treadmill that you jump on and you just can't stop. So one is be ready for the fact that you're gonna be on a treadmill for a long time. Two is to get started somewhere, you just have to work at it. So make a GitHub profile, learn how code control works or version control works and submit code online. So that way people can judge you or work with you on trying to solve it, make it better. Look at other people's code so you can study how they do it so that we can learn the difference between good code and bad code and learn to collaborate and communicate. That's like the biggest skill that a lot of times people are overlooking right now. The idea of this Lone Ranger, being able to figure out how to build a whole entire operating system by yourself, like Linus did, that's not gonna happen anymore. The systems that we have right now is so complex that you really got to learn how to work within the team. You gotta figure out how to be good at selling what you're doing so that way people pay attention and support you. You got to figure out how to be good at communicating what you're trying to do. So that way they're not going to, they're not going to be confused when you tell them to open the door and they do it 10,000 different ways versus the one way that you wanted to do it. You got to figure out how to make it so that the work is enjoyable. So if you make it so it's a miserable experience writing code that's unmaintainable or you're just a kind of a dick or asshole to work with, that's not going to make people want to work with you any, anyway. So what ends up happening is, is, it's not just about when you first get started, it's not just about learning to code. That's like, that's like the, the default. That's like the, that's like the bar. That's like step one. The real thing that you have to work on is how do you make yourself a better person, a more professional person that is, uh, a, you know, someone that wants to work with you, someone that, that's willing to support you, someone that understands what you're trying to do and the plans that you're making to see the success that you want to see. Because if you don't work towards that, you could be the best coder in the world, but Big companies are not going to call you back. Small startups are not going to keep you. And you're just left there trying to figure out how to make your own thing for the, for the next 10, 20 years by yourself. So that's the, that's the thinking behind that. Jerry, do you think most developers don't realize how much time or the own personal time they got to spend on the own personal development? I think so. I think sometimes people underestimate that. I think that oh, they think the company's going to pay them to do it, do it on company time. Yeah. I think there's a, there's an underestimation of that. I think there's, there's, uh, for, for a brief period, I think for maybe the last couple of years, there was a point where the overall community kind of felt like maybe they deserve every single thing. And so therefore they get a little bit more spoiled, a little bit more pampered. But I think at the end of the day, uh, there's always gonna be corrections, right? Cause I, I gone through the first 2001 financial correction. I gone through 2008, um, obviously 2014, 2015 was a small minor one. And now we're going through something also really quite major. Every, every correction to the economy kind of puts a, a sense of reality back into your life. Like the fact that you're going to get overpaid or just getting paid two, three hundred thousand dollars a year just to be able to write software. Like at a certain point, you have to kind of think to yourself, okay, that's not going to last forever, ever. Like if you're really going to be delivering that much value, the company sees it that you're worth maybe your return, maybe 
double that, wherever they paid you back in value. That value doesn't come magically. You have to work at it. And before there was an artificial constriction of supply for the demand. There was more people demanding or needing software made than there were developers and software engineers. And so for a brief moment in time, in the beginning time period, it was, well, there's just not enough people to do it. So I'm gonna overpay a little bit. I'm gonna pay a premium to get someone to help me with it. And that's not true anymore. Now you have developers and coders. It could be anyone around the world. There are amazing, talented developers in South Africa, in Egypt, in Pakistan, in India, in Indonesia, in Mongolia, in Korea, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Poland. Like the number of places where there's people who have studied harder, done more to do better coding than you, it's popping up everywhere. And they all learn how to copy too. So they all learn how to copy Silicon Valley best practices, culture. They know how to figure out how to try to talk the talk and do this and do that. And so now you're not just competing against your local demand and your local supply of developers, you're competing against the whole entire world. So you really have to keep up. You have to invest into yourself. You have to do the work to make it so that you can always deliver value. So that way people always insist on trying to say, you know what, it's worth it to keep on paying these rates. Because when they have to make a judgment call, if you're gonna be the type of person that's hard to work with, they'd rather pay that money way cheaper to somebody else, you know what I'm saying? So there's that kind of switch now to that, to that kind of supply and demand curve. Jerry, how should one pick someone pick their first code or learn, or does that even matter? I think you should pick something where you understand it. If you could find something where you could understand it, that's that's more key than anything else. So for example, um, <clears throat> when I started out. I was trying to learn, my family, was, my, my uncle actually was the biggest driver of technology just because he got exposed to computer programming way, way earlier. Um, he was trying to teach me things like Visual Basic. He was trying to teach me things like C++. And my, you know, I was able to understand a little bit of it. I was trying to decipher the, the actual syntax and the writings and stuff like that. And my brain just never, it never clicked. It just never clicked where I could understand it. And so I started looking into learning HTML, understood that, so I was able to get, figure out how to do that part. I was looking at JavaScript, figured out how to do that, and I was able to get good at that part. And I was trying my best time trying to learn Ruby so I could build websites with Ruby on Rails. And I kind of, just because that was the thing that everyone was into, right? And so everyone was saying, oh yeah, if you get a Ruby on Rails job, you're gonna make 100,000, you're gonna do all this stuff. And I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go try and learn it. Two years in, I realized this was a mistake my brain trying to read that code just doesn't it just doesn't click the way that it's formatted the way that it's, the, the way that it's it, the way that they approached it didn't click with my head and that's not true for a lot of other people it works with them they absolutely loved it where they were able to pick it up and, and do the stuff with it but for me it just wasn't the case so rather than trying to berate myself and say i'm just too stupid for this what i did instead was i'm gonna go find something else and so that magic thing for me was python so once I learned Python, I was looking at Python, reading yeah, Python. I've been reading that recently, like Python is actually a very, very good first language to learn. And I, I, I always thought that Python was kind of complicated, right? Like, yeah. Knowledge, but I've reading that actually Python is like a really good one to learn first. It's accessible. It's readable. Whereas other ones, you have to kind of learn, you have to learn kind of like the syntax or the special code that they're doing. With Python, once I started reading it, I was like, hey, you know what? This reads like poems, like stanzas. So it almost feels like you're writing a little love poems to your computer. And if your computer loves it back, it'll actually do what you tell it to do through these little love poems. And so that clicked with my head, you know? And so it goes back to this good code, back code thing. Make something that's accessible and you'll find your audience and the audience will then support you back. And so other people might have been turned off by Ruby, C++, all these other stuff, but they are in tune with what Python's doing. And in turn, there might be people who don't understand Python, doesn't, they don't get it, but Ruby speaks to them. So your first language does not matter. Try all of them. I think the key here is trying to learn the concepts more, the computer programming concepts more. Like learning what loops do, how to iterate, how do you do order of operation, how do you, how do you think, how do you think like a comp compiler or how do you think a computer, how to do logic decisions, those are more important. The language in which that happens, it could come and go. And it, it will go quite a lot. Like over the course of my 10, 15 years, 
I had to keep on learning new ones over and over and over again, or there's new ways to do things over and over and over again. Within the JavaScript world, there's like 15 different versions of JavaScript that you could be using now to code, right? And each one offers a little, it's a different dialect. So even though everyone speaks English, it's like going to Boston, you have a different type of English. You go to New England, it's a different yeah. type of English. Yeah, and, Texas, and, there yeah. was a different English, there were different accents. It's a, slight, slight. It's, a slight, it's a slight tongue that's a little bit you different. You understand, but you got to maybe listen just a little bit harder. Exactly, right? But then at the same time, if I bring a, a surfer bro from down in SoCal, I, take, I bring some people over to, you know, Ca Southern California, they're not going to understand what the surfer bro is trying to talk about. Like the vernacular and all that stuff, it's just slightly off by a little bit. Your goal is just to figure out how to keep up with all of that. Right. And your goal is just to be worldly enough where facing that type of challenge isn't going to be a problem. Because if you're the type of person that's going to be well traveled and professional enough to say, you know what, I don't care whether or not I'm hanging out with some people eating uh, lobster rolls and still speak to them in, in, in a polite, good way where they could make we can make friends. Or if we're chilling by the beach in Southern California, I can still make friends. That type of mentality, that type of attitude is what gets you way farther than insisting what you're trying to do is the only way or pushing out anything else outside the window. That's the key. Hey, Jerry, say, I know you had a hard stop for three o'clock. Let's do this. Let's, let's, let's do a part two of this, okay? I don't want to spend like 20, 30 minutes on your, your company, right? That's okay with it. you. I will love it. Cool. All right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll see you another calendar link so we can set something up. So we do, That'd be awesome. I'll, I'll do one spend some time on your company. That's so good. I hopefully, I, hopefully, I think I, if people are looking at this and they could get a sense of like, you know what, Silicon Valley is actually kind of rad, but at the same time, it's grounding reality where this dude can't even which, get through such a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't think like they think Silicon right. Valley, you know, they're way up here, like you all like no. re reading minds and stuff, you know, and like super still the same problems, right? Still the same problems. Still got to pay rent. Still got to drive around. Still stuck in traffic. Still got to try to figure out what to eat. You still got to try to figure out how to go find your, find a girlfriend, find a boyfriend. We still have the same problems. It's just that I think the, the thing is, is that you're amazed by the fact that a lot of people have chosen to move out here mm -hmm. to pursue something. And so you're just bombarded by the fact that there's so many smart people around you. And that in turn either makes it so you want to work a little harder to keep up or you just choose not to. And so that's like the biggest thing. It's just like, it's a little bit different out here, but it's not quite as futuristic as, as people make out to be. <laughs> yeah, like that's everyone everyone does have a Tesla. There's no flying cars, you know? No, not yet. Not yet, but we'll see. <laughs> exactly. So we'll see. All right, Jay. Hey, I'm, I'm talking to the live stream right now. We All right, fantastic.